coming this afternoon. I'm Maureen Bosco, and I welcome you to today's uh, discussion, and I will introduce our speaker. Phil Bean is a native of Utica and a graduate of Proctor High School, Union College, yay Schenectady, <laughs> Oxford University, a step above Union, and the <laughs> University of Rochester. <laughs> he has served as a part-time lecturer at Harvard and Hamilton Colleges, and as a dean of Harvard and Haverford Colleges. He's the author of nine peer-reviewed research articles that use Utica as a case study, in addition to the book, The Urban Colonists, Italian American Identity and Politics in Utica, New York. He has served as an associate editor for European Immigration History for the Encyclopedia of New York State. Today, Phil will present a talk about the origins, creation, and restoration of Utica's Olmsted Parks and Parkway system, as well as the area's Olmsted design neighborhoods and efforts by his organization, the Olmsted City of Greater Utica, to restore and enhance Utica's Frederick T. Proctor Park, which was designed by Olmsted and is listed in the National Register of Historic Places. So join me in welcoming. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, it's working. Can you hear me? Yes. No. Yes. I can project my voice. Okay. <laughs> so thank you very much for coming in to listen to me uh, address two interrelated topics uh, to talk about what I call Utica's uh, Olmsted footprint, and then to talk about the efforts of my organization to uh, improve one part of that Olmsted, uh, Olmsted footprint called Frederick T. Parker Park in East Utica. So let's start with some basic uh, facts. Uh, between 1897 and 1923, the Proctor family donated 630 acres of public parkland to the people of Utica. And when I say the Proctors, I really mean specifically Thomas and Mariah Proctor. Uh, Mariah's elder sister, Rachel, played a kind of a cameo role in this story, an important cameo role. Um, but, uh, and, and then uh, Mariah, uh, Rachel's husband, Fred, who was Thomas's brother, two brothers married two sisters, and neither couple had children, as you probably know. Fred had almost nothing at all to do with this story. Uh, and then with Thomas and Mariah, this was more Thomas's thing, and in, in fact, part of what I'm gonna talk about today is how his life experience, more than half of his life, prepared him to become a, a builder of public parks. Uh, and it became really the obsession of the last 20 years of his life. Uh, the Proctors invested a considerable amount of time and resources, and they had plenty of resources between the two of them, uh, uh, working very closely with the leading landscape architect in the United States in the first half of the 20th century, Frederick Law Olmsted, Jr. The system has four components. There's Conkling Park, which is this 385-acre behemoth that runs from Oneida Street to Valley View Road along the parkway, so it includes the tennis courts, the Eagle area, the, uh, the switchbacks, the zoo, and the golf course, plus two more parks, uh, the two Proctor Parks. We often talk about Proctor Park single, singular, uh, but there are actually two of them. They're conjoined by a small strip of land, Frederick T. Proctor Park and Thomas R. Proctor Park, and then the parkway, all of which was designed by Olmsted, except for T.R. Proctor Park, which was designed by T.R. Proctor. It, the system covers an area about 70, over 70% 70 the size of Central Park in Manhattan, and this is for a city that has fewer than 4% as many people as Manhattan has. Um, and um, this system comprises the bulk, like 90% of the public parkland in Utica. The system is on the National Register of Historic Places, and Utica is apparently the smallest community in the country that has an Olmsted design parks and parkways. To give, let's take a, a brief uh, uh, sort of journey into the even deeper past, just so you can get a sense of why we end up with public parks in Utica. And the story I'm going to tell about Utica maps on pretty well to the story that, that played out across the Northeast in all the, the urban industrial centers of the Northeast. Not all of them, but many. So here's a picture of Utica uh, done by the English artist W.H. Bartlett in the middle of the, of the uh, 1830s. 
and it shows Utica as a you know a pretty uh, laid-back kind of town. People are just <laughs> hanging out in the middle of Genesee Street having a chat, and um, and it's a very small city. It was only about eight thousand people at that point, but cities were smaller. So Utica at this time was actually the 29th largest, the most populous city in the country. It was larger than any city you would consider large today, except for Philadelphia, New York, and Boston. Uh, but nonetheless, it was small, and it was it was nestled in the forest. Because and one of the things for our purposes, I want you to know, is how how the countryside is really easily within reach in this Utica. In fact, if Bartlett had turned around and done a picture of what was behind him, you would have just seen pretty much a wall of trees at this point. Um, so, um, and by the way, and people who who uh, lived and worked here made a very good living in those days. Um, and there were a lot of artisanal craftsmen doing work in this town. It was a bustling little place. Fast forward less than a generation, and this is Utica, is rapidly turning into an industrial center, a modern industrial center, as you can see from the smokestacks. And um, more and more people need, the majority of people are, are working in industry, uh, predominantly in the textile mills, working 10 and 12 hours a day. 60 hour weeks were just normal. And the only question was, how many more hours than 60 did you actually work uh, in Utica uh, and, and in places like it? People were living in more and more densely populated neighborhoods, and the, those neighborhoods could hardly be considered bucolic. And on top of everything else, people were working so many hours for so little pay that they had neither the time nor the money to go out to the countryside and this was actually one of the reasons the Proctors cited for why they felt Utica needed parks. Because, to give you a, a, some sense of where the status quo was before they started, and, the, and therefore the immensity of what the Proctors accomplished in Utica, this is Utica in 1890. It had only three parks, covering a total of seven acres for 44,000 people. And, the city was growing in leaps and bounds, as it would into the 20th century. Um, and so uh, these three parks really had, were almost of no utility for a population that was working very hard and needed an opportunities to relax and to have contact with nature. Now this is 1890. Now I'm going to show you what the Proctors accomplished over the course of the, 20, the, court, of the quarter century that succeeded. So what they did was they either built themselves, or in the case of the Parkway, uh, they persuaded the city of Utica, and in fact, Thomas R. Proctor engaged in a little bit of subterfuge to get the city of Utica to build the Parkway, um, and, and they created a green belt that embraced the city. Initially, it was five miles long, but for reasons I can go into if you want to in, in question and answer, it, today it's more like three miles. Uh, but it embraced the, the entire the city because you have to keep in mind that there was no South Utica at this time. The, the New Hartford boundary was, by, was mostly along Pleasant Street and Burstone Road. Uh, what we now know is South Utica was annexed in the 1920s after all this park building had been accomplished. This is a huge accomplishment, and, especially, and, and it's an unusual amenity for such a small uh, post-industrial, if you will, Rust Belt city. This is not normal. How did it come into being? Well, a lot of it has to do with this little boy in the picture. That's Thomas R. Proctor with his father, Moody Stickney Proctor. Now, it's often said that, that Thomas R. Proctor was from, from Vermont, which is true. However, the reality is he really grew up in Boston. Uh, his, uh, his family originally came from the Boston area. Uh, his grandfather was a, a you know, kind of reasonably well-off guy who served in the American Revolution, and he moved out to Vermont and made even more money. And then his son, Moody, decided shortly after Thomas was born, when he was just an infant, to move to Boston, where he went into um, uh, uh, buying and selling agricultural products, uh, including wool, although this invoice you, can, you might notice is for cheese, so he was doing a lot of different kinds of trade. Uh, and so he just walked into Boston and started this, this mercantile firm. And then within five years, he bought a hotel. Uh, and it was not just any hotel, it was the Marlboro Hotel, which 
was the place where the governor of Massachusetts and much of the state legislature stayed when the legislature was in session in Boston. So it was a respectable place. And then eventually, with the profits he made from all that, he went into the textile business, and he owned textile mills in Vermont in both uh, cotton and woolen goods. So Thomas R. Proctor came from a family that had a little bit of money, and then his father turned that into even more money. And also, Thomas R. Proctor grew up in Boston. Again, he came as an infant, and he stayed there until he was about 19, 20 years old, at which point he volunteered to serve in the Union Navy uh, for a few years. They moved around a little bit in the, in the, during their Boston period, but for much of the time, they lived within a 10 to 15 minute walk of the Boston Common and the Boston Public Gardens. 75 acres of some of the best urban parkland in the country. You gotta remember that Central Park did not exist when, when, the, when he had access to this land. So this is, what, what I'm trying to do now is give you a sense of how a, a park builder evolved through his experience, the things that he did and experienced in life. And this was Fundamental Building Block. It gave him a model of what he eventually decided he wanted to do for the people of Utica. Meanwhile, in Utica, they had seven acres of parkland. He had 75 right on his doorstep. So here he is uh, a few years before he came to Utica in 1869, before he got the beard for which he's uh, better known. Uh, and uh, he, in December 1869, he just waltzed into Utica and he bought the Bags Hotel. Uh, now to put this in context, Utica, uh, New York was still the Empire State. It was the most populous and wealthiest state in the Union, and Utica was one of the most important cities in the state. It is, it is a rapidly expanding industrial center. Lots and lots of wealth is being, uh, is being generated. At the point that he showed up, it was just past the period when it was doing a lot of innovative works in the fields of communications and transportation. It was a happening place. And the Bax Hotel was the oldest, most prestigious, uh, and uh, at that point, still, I think, the largest and swankiest hotel in, in, in Utica. So, you know, for years I thought, how did this 25-year-old kid come into Utica and buy this hotel? Well, now we know because his father, his family had more money than I think we know. And, and not only that, in January 1867, his father, Moody, went out for a walk in a blizzard and he got pneumonia and died. And so Thomas got, at a very young age, got a big inheritance. And, in eight, and so it's with that inheritance that he was able to buy this hotel. And as it, those of you who are local history buffs might know that he also then went on to take a long-term lease on something called the Butterfield House, which was another big and important hotel. And the general consensus in the area was that he whipped both of those hotels into shape. This hoteling was in their blood. His grandfather and his uncles ran inns in New England. His father ran the Marlboro Hotel. In fact, Thomas lived for part of his childhood in the Marlboro Hotel. And, um, and, and Thomas's first cousin bought the largest and uh, poshest hotel in New York City in the mid uh, 19th century, the St. Nicholas Hotel, the first building in New York City that was built at the cost of a million dollars. So these people knew something about running hotels. So with this hotel, with this hotel went a farm that was located in East Utica at the intersection of Welshbush Road and Culver Avenue. And on this farm, they raised food for the dining room at the hotel. He also raised prized livestock that was sold all over in markets all over the Northeast. A certain spot, part of this farm, however, was not suitable for agriculture. There was a declivity or a ravine. It was called the Silver Spring Glen. So he bought this in December 1869, and in the spring of 1870, people came to him and said, we'd like to go picnic in the Glen. And he said, sure. And then he found out that a lot of people wanted to go there, and it became a very popular place, it had already been a popular place, and it continued in the 1870s and 80s to be a popular location for fraternal societies and church organizations and just families to go and have their picnics. So here's another step on his way to becoming a builder of public parks because by accident, he ends up running a, a very small, semi-public park. Um, so, 
The next step has to do with Ridgefield Springs. Now, again, those of you who know your local history or interested in Utica history um, might have come across references to Thomas Proctor being involved with Ridgefield Springs. This plays in a hugely important part in his evolution. Um, because, so, as you might know, in the 19th and early 20th centuries, the elites in Europe and the United States used to go off to the seaside, to the mountains, and to spa towns, you know, places where they had natural springs and people would take the water, they drink the water, they bathe in the water for health purposes, and, uh, and just hang out and have a good time. Places where they wanted to be seen, and, to see and be seen, uh, where all the right people went. And, um, and, uh, and, and, and part of the objective was to get away from the noise, uh, the heat, the humidity and the very ripe odors of large American cities. There were thousands and thousands of horses in New York City. And just imagine what they were doing as they were doing what they were doing um, and how that smelled in July and August. So <clears throat> now Richfield, so the premier place, at least in the Northeast of this sort, was of course Saratoga, right? And um, and Richfield Springs was considered a backwater, um, and it was considered a rustic place. It wasn't exactly a place where if you wanted to see and be seen, you would go it, it went, um, it, in the uh, 1870s, the early 1870s. Well, Thomas R. Proctor, uh, you know, the family had a knack for seeing opportunities, and he inherited that, and he saw something in this town. And so he bought a, a small, a hotel capable of accommodating a few dozen people that was kind of antiquated called the Spring House. And he invested a ton of money in expanding the Spring House so that it could accommodate 600 people. Uh, he wired it for electricity, electric lights, electric service bells, electric elevators, and of course he ran uh, a very nice dining room. But people didn't come there just to take the waters and have nice meals and sit in nice rooms. They also wanted, uh, on their off hours, to go out, have places outdoors where they could hang out and relax in the shade and just um, enjoy uh, nature. Well, this inspired Thomas R. Proctor to landscape the grounds of the spring house in ways that were not so dissimilar from the parks that he had known in Boston. And so now he has become, at this point, an active builder of landscapes for the enjoyment of the public. But at this point, it's the paying public and the well-paying public. This wasn't cheap. Not only that, um, but he then in encouraged other property owners in, uh, in Richfield Springs and also investors outside of Richfield Springs, including that cousin who owned that St. Nicholas Hotel, to do likewise, to upgrade their hotels, to, uh, to uh, landscape their, their grounds. And the New York Times and other publications recognized Thomas R. Proctor, New York Times, in fact, said, uh, thanks to the efforts of T.R. Proctor, Richfield Springs, which once was a kind of a, a, a not especially popular place, has turned uh, into a park, the whole town, because they said that all the lawns are manicured, it's all beautifully landscaped, it's all, and, and you can't tell where you step off the grounds of one hotel and onto the grounds of another, it's just one huge park. Another thing that uh, brought him in a sort of cut his teeth in, in, uh, in the park building and management business was something called the Utica Parks Association on whose board he served, and he actually was vice president of it in the 1870s and 80s. The Utica Parks Association ran something called the Utica Driving Park, which was located uh, where the Masonic home is now located in East Utica. Um, so uh, among other things, you know, one of the things that they, they offered at this park uh, was uh, what they offered at Saratoga, horse races in the summer. However, this wasn't just a racetrack, it was a park, and it was a well-manicured park, and again, national publications said it was a beautifully located, beautifully landscaped place. So it was a place where, again, people would go to picnic, uh, but, uh, and they came from as far as places like Little Falls and Herkimer, which in those days was quite a trek, and um, given the roads that existed at the time, and um, uh, uh, big public events like Fourth of July events, the fireworks, uh, fairs, the state fair was held there. It was a very, very popular place. But again, it was a commercial enterprise. It was a business. You had to pay to get in and you had to pay to access 
what it had to offer. In 1891, when he was 47 years old, his life uh, took a turn for the better when he, when he married uh, Mariah Watson Williams. Uh, as you know, Mariah had, a, she and her sister in 1894 came into a lot of money. Um, uh, when her mother died, she left them 50-50, uh, a total of 3.5 uh, million dollars. Now, today, I would love, and, uh, and invite any of you who want to do this, to get 3.5 million dollars. <laughs> But in those days, to give you a sense of context, that was translated into something more like $100 million in today's money. So that was a lot of money. And believe it or not, Thomas was almost as wealthy as that. So this was a, it was a, it was a real love match, but it was also a, so they were also a power couple. And, um, and they shared a lot of interests. And one of the things that they loved to do was they loved to travel. And, and uh, so they traveled to Europe and they traveled to the United States and saw all the great uh, cities of the uh, Atlantic world. And when they went to these cities, they, they checked out the, the, the great urban parks of these cities. And here's Thomas showing in what is likely uh, Kensington Gardens in London. That's Kensington Gardens today. <clears throat> so here, uh, here's Thomas again, Mariah's in the middle. And there's, that's Rachel, uh, um, uh, Mariah's elder sister who is an interesting figure in her own right, but we won't get into that in this, in this talk. Um, and so um, Thomas, at this point, this is the mid 1890s, he's kind of retired. He's gotten rid of the hotels. Um, he serves on the board of directors of some local corporations and is an officer on some of them, but for the most part, he's a man of leisure. And the problem with that is, although when you see pictures of him, he looks pretty sedate, uh, all buttoned up and, you know, striking a certain kind of uh, proper pose. But if you look at what he did, and especially if you look at his private correspondence, you, f you find he actually was a pretty intense guy. He was pretty driven. He was somebody who needed to do, to do things, and he especially liked to build and improve things. And uh, so when this picture was taken, I had a sense that he was a man without a mission, and he def desperately needed one. But he still hadn't come to the conclusion of like, at this point, he had spent more than half of his life, about a half century, having something to do either as a user or as a builder or as a manager of public, large public landscapes. But he hadn't yet come to the conclusion, as far as we know, that he should become a builder of public parks. And that is where a simple act by Mariah and, and, um, and Rachel uh, provided the tipping point. You know, from tiny acorns do mighty oaks grow. And, um, and what happened was they, part of the, the inheritance they got, because it was, it, was it was a kind of very diverse portfolio of investments, was a small parcel of property on James Street, Corn Hill, which was then developing into one of the better middle class neighborhoods in Utica. And, uh, and I believe it was bought by their father and they, so they transformed that into a park, which they named for their father, James Watson Williams, who was a lawyer and former mayor of Utica. Now this park was only seven acres. Uh, so, and there were already only seven acres of parkland in Utica. So in one fell swoop, they doubled the amount of parkland to 14 acres. Still not a lot, but it was definitely a step forward. And I, I think, you know, this is a supposition on my part, but I think that this set off a light bulb in Proctor's head. He saw this as an example of what he wanted to do, and in fact, this was going to become the kind of work that would occupy much of the rest of his life for the next 20 years. Two years later, this was 1897, in 1899, he decided he didn't need the farm anymore. He wasn't running the hotels. Now, he did sell, as I said, livestock in northeastern markets. But uh, he decided to shut most of it down and to transform it into a park. And he landscaped it as himself and he, he turned it into a park that initially they called a children's park. He wanted to call it a children's park, but people called it Thomas Proctor's Park and the name stuck. And so to this day it's called Thomas R. Proctor Park. About 60 acres. Um, when I said, as I said, he landscaped it himself. It was his private property from 1899 to 1909 when it was donated, but the public were welcome. And on some days, according to local newspaper accounts, there was as many as a thousand people in this park. Mm -hmm. 
So when you consider Utica was between 40 and 50,000 people, or about almost 50, 55 to 60,000 people at this time, that's, that's a lot. So in 1907, uh, Thomas and Mariah donated two more parks, each, each of them only 15 acres. Uh, Addison Miller Park and Horatio Seymour Park, both of which are uh, west of Genesee Street off of Burstone Road. Um, again, not a lot of land, but it was a step forward, and by that point, the Proctor family had donated between the seven at Watson Williams, the 60 at Proctor Park, and then these, the 30 of these two parks, almost 100 acres. So Utica went from seven acres of public park land to 100. But they ain't seen nothing yet. Because what was going on, the public did not know, was behind the scenes, he'd been quietly buying up farmland on the southern boundary of Utica, near the Forest Hill Cemetery on something called Steel Hill. Uh, and he initially wanted to call this the, well, he called it as a kind of placeholder, the Valley View Park. But eventually, it would become known as Roscoe Compton Park, named for the U.S. Senator from, New York, from Utica, who was a friend of his and whom he admired. So, of course, he's Thomas R. Proctor. He's been working with landscaping for, for decades. He knows how to do this kind of thing. He was a man who worked miracles with all kinds of propositions. Well, part of the secret in life is knowing the limits of your competency. Uh, and on this project, he met his limit. I mean, he's trying to build roads on the sides of the hills. He, he just was in, in over his head, and he realized that in the winter of 1905-06. Now, before that, shortly before that, if you wanted to build a park, you wanted a top-notch park, you would have gone to Frederick Law Olmsted Sr., the father of the American urban park. Um, he, with Calvert Vox, he co-designed Central Park in New York, and, and this and his innumerable uh, uh, projects across the, the uh, especially the northern part of this country, um, established two principles. First of all, if you want to be considered a first-class city, you needed to have a large urban park, like sort of like the ones that they designed. And secondly, they established the, the design principles that everybody else tried to copy. Um, rather than use continental European designs, which were very geometric and symmetrical uh, and had lots of formal plantings and colorful flowers and exotic plants, they tried to make their parks naturalized. Uh, first of all, they agreed with the dictum of the 18th century English landscaper William Kent that nature abhors a straight line. So you, you find it's all the paths and roads are curvilinear, usually going around the natural land, uh, shape of the land. Um, and when they had to change the topography to make their plans work, they redid it in such a way that you'd think it had always been that way. They were great masters of illusion. They also would have many, many trees, but then it'd be like, punctuated by either bodies of water or, or lawns, like the sheep meadow or the, the great lawn in Central Park, which the ad local analog for which is the meadow at F.T. Proctor Park, which was supposed to be evocative of a countryside meadow. Again, they wanted you to feel as though you're out of the city when you went into a park like this. And so Olmsted was very prolific for, for like four decades he went on um, and he did all kinds of projects. He designed the first parks and parkway system in the United States in Buffalo, uh, and then another one in Louisville. And then towards the end of his life, he took on some massive projects, the Biltmore Estate in Asheville, North Carolina, where he had to landscape thousands of acres. Uh, and then the, um, the 1893 uh, World's Exposition, the Columbian Exposition, also known as the White City Exposition, did landscape design for that. And he had as his helper during the summers his youngest son, Frederick Law Olmsted Jr., known in the family as Rick. Uh, he was still a student at Harvard, but he was, uh, dad brought him in to be his helper. Well, senior was gone by the time 1905 06 rolled around, but Junior and his elder brother, John Charles, created a firm called Olmsted Brothers to succeed, carry on the family business, and it went on, that, that firm stayed in business into the late 20th century. Um, and so Junior, you know, people who have highly accomplished parents, many of them spend their lives in the shadow of their parents and they never really 
kind of break out. That's not what happened with Junior. He became the leading landscape architect of this first half of the 20th century in the United States. Um, not that long out of Harvard, he helped to start the landscape architecture program uh, at, uh, at Harvard, the world's, world's first and still most prestigious. He sat on two federal commissions that over the course of 25 years redesigned much of central Washington, D.C. Did the landscape design for the Jefferson Memorial. He did the designs that are still used to, to this day for the White House grounds. Um, he was a driving force behind the creation of the National Park Service in 1916. And he did uh, some design work on national parks, including the road system at Acadia National Park in Maine. Uh, he wrote the report that led to the uh, creation of Everglades National Park, and he also was a driving force behind the uh, the, uh, re the, uh, the saving of what was left of the giant redwood woods in California, in addition to, to, to doing the, the master plan for the California State Park System. So he did a lot. But while he, he and his firm were doing these kind of public spaces, part of their bread and butter was also designing neighborhoods, suburban style neighborhoods that use Olmstead Park design principles. And on the East Coast, the most famous is Forest Hills Gardens in Queens. And on the West Coast, Palace Verde's Estates in Los Angeles. Well, so he started working in Utica in 1906, and he and Proctor worked together pretty intensively. I mean, if you read the correspondence, it's sometimes it's really intensively, because Proctor had a lot of opinions. Um, <laughs> and um, uh, for about 10 years. And this, though, began uh, more, more, more generally about uh, several decades of intensive uh, involvement by Olmsted and his firm Olmsted Brothers in Utica, uh, because which did not come to end in the 1950s when they did some preliminary designs for the campus of Utica College, which unfortunately, none of which were ever used. Um, so real, when Olmsted came to Utica to start work on, first on Conkling Park, and then he was involved off and on for decades with, with the parkway, and then finally, with F.T. Proctor Park, local real estate developers came to him and said, we want you to, to design some neighborhoods for us. So Utica, in addition to having this gigantic parks and parkway system uh, largely designed by Olmsted, also has five Olmsted design neighborhoods. And if you put those neighborhoods together with the parks and parkway system, uh, about a tenth of Utica's land mass was designed by Olmsted and his firm Olmsted Brothers. Even more if you factor out the wetlands in Utica, which are largely unbuilt. Um, and it's for that reason that we refer to Utica as an Olmsted city. Not the Olmsted city, but an Olmsted city. Uh, it's, it's about as good a claim as many places have. The pinnacle of their achievement, uh, that is the collaboration between the Proctors and, and Olmsted, was Frederick T. Proctor Park. It was built between 1912 and 1914, covers 62 acres, and it was considered the gem or the jewel in the entire Olmsted Parks and Parkway system in Utica. And if you take a look at those pictures, you get a sense of why people thought. It was a gorgeous place, and so it remained for many decades. Unfortunately, it did not last. And in fact, the whole system went into decline in the 1970s and 80s. Now, before we say, ah, there is Utica again, <laughs> um, alas, no. Um, across the north, every city that had these large um, pub, urban public parks that came from this era, they went into decline. If you had gone to Central Park in the 70s and 80s, as maybe some of you did, you would know that large parts of Central Park had turned into a dump, and in fact, some parts of it were a scary dump in the 1970s and 80s. This was turned around by the a, the creation of a public-private partnership, a nonprofit that came in and worked hand in glove with the city of New York to re first to restore and then to maintain Central Park and to return, keep it, uh, to return to what it was and to keep it that way. And so now today, 75% of the cost of, of maintaining Central Park is, is, is borne by that private nonprofit, not the city of New York. For those of you who are native and proud, defiant upstaters, I should also note that the people in New York City did not invent this idea. It was actually people in Buffalo who came up with this idea in 1979, and all the rest of us copied them. 
And that's what my group does. We, we, have, we are a nonprofit organization. We have no employees. We are all volunteer. And we work really closely with the city of Utica and doing what we're doing. Now, I'm going to give you an overview of what we've done in the last two years so it can give you a sense of the impact that we've had and what we're trying to do. So we were founded in, uh, at the end of August of 2021 at, when there wasn't too much season left and to be perfectly candid, we didn't have a lot of resources. Uh, but uh, our friends at Gerber's Tavern in downtown Utica made us a nice gift and we decided to devote it to starting to rehabilitate the ravine that runs north-south through the park. It's a, it's a place that used to be very beautiful, it has great potential, but it's like other parts of the park, it turned into a jungle. And so on the upper left-hand corner, you see a picture of the head of that ravine. And of course, you can't see into the ravine because it's all covered over. So we, we opened that up, we created a planting bed along the perimeter, and then we installed some shrubs in it that, that flower in rotation over the course of the, of the season. Simple little project to kick things off. The next year, we got a lot more ambitious. So, in the park, there's something called the north side. And if you go from the parking lot downhill into the lower level of the park, eventually you'll see the Starch Factory Creek, which runs through both of the Proctor Parks. And you'll also, if you know that area, there's a stone bridge that goes across the creek. Well, what's on the other side of the creek is the north side of the creek. And it's for, for decades, it's been what I call a little Hansel and Gretel. It's, it's, a, it's a little overgrown and, and uh, unkempt. It used to be, uh, Back in when it was first started, Olmsted came up with an elegant design for this part of the park. Um, and one of the focal points of it was this, a carrot circle that had this beautiful uh, landscaping in the middle. And uh, at, 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 at the very center of it was a stone column with one of the three Proctor eagles. Well, unfortunately, the eagle has flown away, and we don't know where it's landed. Um, and there are rumors on the streets, but nobody seems to ever really give us a meaningful lead. And the column was falling apart. That's the way it looked five years ago when I got involved in all of this. And the only reason, the only way I could get that picture was by climbing about 25 feet into the forest. You couldn't see this from the service road. Uh, so. We asked the city of Utica if they would clear this open as part of a multi-year effort, which is now in year four, and, um, and it's probably gonna take us another three, four years if we're gonna succeed at this, um, to rehabilitate the north side circle, I'm uh, sorry, the north side of the park. And when they opened up the circle area, they also rolled in stone to, to create something like the carriageway, although the whole park is pedestrianized. Um, it's not an exact recreation for reasons I can tell you if you really want to know at the time. Um, and then once they had done that, uh, we recruited a very nice man called Scott Jackson who teaches um, stonemasonry and carpentry at Mohawk Valley Community College. And he decided to make the restoration of the column a class project. For various reasons, again, I can tell you why if you want, really want to know. We wanted to move it eight feet to the north. So he and his students took it apart, they numbered every single piece, they mapped the whole thing, they created a new base for it, and then they rebuilt it for us. And so now, and they did a very nice job. Uh, they're also nice people to work with, Scott's great. Um, and then we came in and we landscaped it with about, I think it's something on the order of 1,200 plants. Um, and it took us about seven or eight sessions. It involved dozens of people giving their time freely to do this. Um, I should pause for a moment to give you an overview of what we've done in the last two years. We have planted 3,000 perennial plants in this park. We, we plant almost no annuals. They're, it's all perennials, uh, or almost all perennials. Uh, we put maybe a few annuals up by the gate just to accent it. Um, from the, of those 3,000 perennials, there are 34 trees. We have installed a dozen benches, and another half dozen are coming this year. We have, re we, by the end of the spring, we'll have repaired two stones, historic stone staircases. We will have it, uh, done the lily pond, which I'll talk about, and we will have invested over a quarter of a million dollars in this park. So this is what the north side circle 
looked like when we were first done. We also installed two benches up there. Now it's a lot more grown out, and it's turning into the forest garden we wanted it to be. Um, you, the, old, the old design th that was there before, which had canna lily, the canna's, 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 uh, are they called canna lilies? Canna's. Canna. Um, th those were more to Proctor's taste probably than Olmstead's, and I think Olmstead probably would have preferred this. Um, at least that's what I tell myself. <laughs> Then there was this project we did the same year, and you'll say, what is that? <laughs> uh, well, uh, it's hard to see, but behind all that overgrowth is a, an elaborate stone staircase that was built by unemployed workers during the 1930s under the auspices of a federal relief program called the Works Progress Administration, or WPA. Well, it not only had been largely engulfed by, by uh, nature, but also the base of it was in horrendous condition. It was this ugly, unkempt, sort of broken up patch of black top, uh, and water was gathering all over the place. Now, that wall that you see there, there's a, there's a pipe that comes out of it because it, it was put there intentionally to let spring water, the springs in the hill, drip out of there. Um, and people in the old days used to gather it and drink it for health purposes. Don't drink the water in this part, please, <laughs> it's contaminated. Um, so we thought, well, maybe the drainage system, the, the plate that was there is broken, the drainage system needs to be fixed. Well, we had a stonemason come in and dig it up, and, and it was a little bit, involved a little bit more work than we anticipated. <laughs> because off the left there, 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 in the 30s, they put this L-shaped pipe to take water from the upper level across the, the lily pond plateau and down to the lower level, because water always wants to go to the lowest point unless it doesn't have a channel, and the pipe broke, and so it was accumulating there. Not only that, but the stonemason showed us that there was, water wasn't just coming out of the pipe, the, the, the little pipe, the, the, the spring water that was intended to come out of but that pipe was also seeping out of the entire 20-foot perimeter of the staircase. So this is why the whole place was all mucky. Uh, so we had him not only repair the pipe, but we also had him put in a 600 cubic foot uh, French drain to carry off the water. And then on top of that, we had him put a 200 square foot patio. And now instead of having this, we have this. A little bit closer to what it used to be. And, and we're gonna be doing still more work in this area uh, oh, and, uh, over the coming years. Another project involved this thing. This is from 19, an original piece of Olmsted architecture from the, um, from, from the earliest days. They called it a fountain. It's like kind of a trough. Um, over the years, it was changed. They, 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 he stacked slate on a lot of things, which you know, in this climate doesn't last very long. So in the 30s, they put field stones, which is consistent with the general homestead style. And, and then, it, uh, again, they turned off the water because they didn't want people drinking it. And at some point, one group uh, turned it into a, into a planter, which was a great idea. The only problem was when they turned it into a planter, water gathered in it and when the winter came the water froze and it heaved out and it started popping stones off of the facing of this thing so by the time i got involved with this five years ago this is what it looked like looks great right and, uh, <laughs> and so we asked this kindly family to to pull away all the growth and eventually we unearthed uh the the uh, this trough and then we dug out the interior and the stone, so the stonemason could then fix the out exterior finish on this to finish the interior so that we could have that planter, but then also to put in what are known as weepers, which are, are holes to drain water out so that this, this will increase the longevity of the work that we invested in. And then uh, we rolled in a crushed stone to put a pathway around it and then built a planting bed and then put in about 150 plants around it. And now it's called the Peace Garden. This is what it looked like. We also installed two benches. This is what it looked like when we first started, but um, it takes about a couple of years for it to fully mature. And this is the way it looked after, it, this is the way it looked in its second year. And it's become a popular little destination park. Then there's the Lily Pond. Uh, so the Lily Pond is a cement reflecting pool that was designed by Olmsted in 1913 uh, and built the same year. It was uh, iconic, uh, one of the most iconic aspects of the whole park system. It's very, very popular. But after 100 years of service, it got kind of 
110 years of service actually got run down. The walls that still existed, the original walls that still existed, were all pockmarked marked and patched in various ways over the years. The floor was pockmarked. One of the walls collapsed and they dropped a preform uh, cement concrete wall in, uh, you know, in its place. Another wall, this wall, if you look at it closely, you can see that the wall was cracking. Uh, so they expected it to collapse and they didn't expect it to contain water. And instead of replacing it, they just dropped another one of those concrete walls in front of it. So there were two walls on one side. It wasn't pretty, but it, was, it, it worked. Uh, well, we decided that since um, the 2023 was the centennial of the donation of the park to the people of Utica, Mariah Proctor, uh, then a widow of three years, decided to give the park uh, to the people of Utica. Uh, that we would uh, uh, recreate the lily pond. So uh, we stripped it down to the original foundation and found that the walls were in much worse condition than anybody knew. Uh, and then began, began the process of rebuilding it. And this is the way it looked before it was landscaped. We had asked the architects who did this design to also design us an Olmsted-inspired winding pathway across the uh, plateau to, because there, was, there were all these elements on that plateau, but they weren't unified anyway. So this pathway does a number of different things. One, it turned all that stuff into uh, a, an ensemble. And, um, and what I'm talking about is the lily pond, the, the road to the lower level that's nearby, three pathways, two historic stone staircases, and, and the little buildings called the bathhouses, which we'll talk about in a moment. Um, we also, so what it is now is not only an ensemble, it's also a crossroads in the park. It permits people to go this way and that way. And public health research has suggested that the uh, urban public parks that have walking loops are 90% are more likely to get visitors. And, and those visitors are 80% more likely to engage in exercise. So a lot of what we've been doing is creating or recreating loops within the park. And it also became a destination in its own right because once all this was finished, we then landscaped it with about 120 plants uh, and uh, we installed a half dozen benches. Then there's the, the pavilion. Uh, this is the pavilion uh, that was uh, by the parking lot um, and it's probably built in the 60s or 70s. Um, it was small, it was utilitarian, not very decorative. Um, and in 2022, the city of Utica decided it was going to invest some of its COVID relief money in the creation of a larger pavilion and one in, that in design is a little bit more suitable to a, a park like this that's on the National Register of Historic Places. Then they approached us and said, would you design and build uh, planting beds in front of this pavilion? And we said, okay, you're on. So first we created beds and here you see uh, uh, the, the first stage of creating those beds was done uh, by uh, students from Utica University uh, um, in their um, first year orientation program, they had to do a day of service. And then we continued that with other volunteers and then we brought in plants and our volunteers planted the whole thing and <coughs> we transformed the area. So now between the new pavilion, the four planting beds we created and the fact that the city of Utica properly repaid the, the, the parking lot probably for the first time in 20 years, um, <laughs> The first impression people will have of this park will be more suitable. Um, it'll be much more positive. Mm -hmm. And finally, among the things that, in terms of the work that we've done, so the bathhouses, these little huts are known as the bathhouses. Um, they're done in field stone, which is consistent with the general Olmsted style, um, but um, they were actually designed by the Utica City engineers in the 1930s, and in 1938, the WPA built them. They were originally uh, public restrooms but they ceased to serve that function long ago. And in fact, today we now have access up to them as storage uh, spaces for our, our, uh, for our supplies and our equipment. So when you're on the Lily Pond Plateau, you look down the plateau and you see those little buildings, you see trees in the back, you say, well, that's where the plateau ends. But in fact, it continues and it comes to a point behind them. So there's a little triangular, triangular area behind there that's beautifully canopied by trees. And it has this kind of wishbone uh, uh, pathway. It's not very well kept, but it's there. Um, and then, so there's some, some issues. A, that the path isn't very well de designed. B, 
if you try to go up the hill, up that the top the, the top piece of the wishbone, if it, as it were, to go to the back to the upper level of the park, well, it's intersected by the bed of a drainage stream. So whenever it rains heavily, this was put in there, probably original, maybe the 30s, to channel water down in an orderly way to the lower level of the park. Well, people don't want to walk, obviously, you know, understandably in, in that, and they won't go on stepping stones. Instead, they insist on throwing logs into it um, and creating a primitive bridge that way. And we take them out and they put them back in. So, and the problem with this is it, those, those bridges that they create are also dams. And so there, there are pools of stagnant water that just stay up there much of the time, which are great breeding grounds for insects. Uh, and also it, it makes parts of the path mucky. So they're actually making the situation even worse. So, you know, if you can't beat him, join him. So we decided that we, we are going to uh, build a footbridge over that, that, uh, that drainage uh, uh, stream. And uh, we will also institute some, some better water management uh, measures to complement that. But the big part of this project, which we are calling the Bathhouse Nature Trail, is this uh, staircase which is one of the original characters, or at least part of it's original. It was, it was largely rebuilt in the 30s. Um, and it is, as you can probably tell from the picture, it's, it's collapsing. Um, and in fact, all the stairs are cockeyed. And on the side, the walls that should be providing a little bit of safety uh, for, for, for pedestrians has just fallen off. So we've hired a contractor to take down the exterior wall to rebalance the stairs. He is taking all the chunks of concrete that have, have the stones that, that were used to build the outer wall, and he's chipping out every one of those stones, and then he's gonna use them to rebuild the outer wall. So by the end of the spring, we'll have the footbridge, we'll have this, this staircase reactivated. Um, so that gives you a sense of, of what we've been up to. So in closing, I just wanna, I wanna pose a question that all good students of history, and I think all good citizens should ask themselves. There are a lot of good and true things out there in the world, but we need to ask ourselves, who cares? I mean, why do we do this? I mean, what, what is the whole point of doing this? Uh, a, lot, a lot of people will assume that, it's a, that we are motivated by nostalgia, by historic preservation, by an interest in beautification, and I think that all of us, our generous donors, our dedicated volunteers, uh, my board, um, uh, the city of Utica, we're, we're all motivated by this in part. But for many of us, there are much bigger issues at stake here. Um, we see ourselves engaged in an enterprise to promote better public health in Utica, to improve the quality of life for all people living in Utica, and to build a better future for this community. So to begin with, a high percentage of people in Utica suffer from lifestyle diseases like diabetes and especially hypertension. The, the rate of hypertension in Utica is something like eight or 10% higher than the state average. Mm -hmm. um, so very well resourced public health, health research, longitudinal research involving thousands of people's, uh, people in a, um, in a multiplicity of communities uh, done by some of the leading public health institutions in this country has shown what Olmsted knew intuitively in the 19th century, which is spending time in urban parks like this confers significant physical and mental health benefits on the people who do so. So, um, and so, so uh, we, we, we see the parks as a means for promoting public health. And this research has shown that even if you just sit, I mean, you don't have to run around or you don't have to, to go on long hikes. Even if you sit on a park bench in a park like this, the research shows that it lowers your blood pressure and the people who do so report that their sense of well-being is enhanced. High percentage of, the, of uh, members of the community, especially but not exclusively the refugee populations, uh, are, are contending with, um, with trauma. Um, and again, the parks have a therapeutic medicinal impact on many such people. And it's for that reason that you see so many people from our refugee communities using this park, as well as Conklin Park in particular. 
Um, and we also want to make a contribution, finally, to economic development and population retention. I just mentioned the refugees. You all know that the reason why Utica's population uh, drop was not only arrested, but reversed because of the refugees. And, and in fact, that has made Utica one of only three cities in New York State that has experienced population growth in, over the course of the last two consecutive U.S. censuses, the other two being Schenectady and New York City. Um, and so, but I tend to think in three, five, 10, 20, 30 year chunks, the question I ask myself is, are there children and grandchildren, especially the ones who develop their skills and talents, are they gonna stick around? And the same thing would be said about people who are coming to Utica. We're hearing more and more about people not from this region who have come to Utica to work at places like Wolfspeed and Dan Foss and the hospital downtown and the Masonic Medical Research Institute, Hamilton College, um, the Griffiths uh, uh, Industrial Park. Um, and a lot of these people are coming because they've been offered an opportunity. But are they gonna to wanna to stick around? Or are they just gonna use this place as a stepping stone? Not just Utica, but the whole area. And so um, what occurs to us, what's striking to us, is that many of these people come from or have spent significant time in major, major metropolitan areas in this country. And they are accustomed to these large urban parks. And they know the name Olmsted. They know it better than a lot of people in this region do. Uh, to them, it has cachet. And that's, again, one of the reasons why we call ourselves Olmsted City, because we're trying to rebrand Utica and give Utica a positive narrative that's true. But, and this is where I'll stop, public health research, or researchers have also found out something that I think every one of us will say is just common sense. People are far less likely to go to parks like this if they're in a bad state of repair. So we need to put it, them into a better state of repair and keep them that way so that they can be assets, not just for Utica, but for the entire region. So that's where I'll stop. Thank you very much. You've been a great time. And um, and uh, and that is that question comes up in conversation quite a bit. Uh, I I have no idea. I mean, we try to stick only to the Olmstead stuff, and at that we're we're concentrating on this one tenth of the Olmstead system because my observation is that um, when people want to renew communities, um, they especially when they get money and drips and drabs, they run around and they try to spread it all over the place and they do a good work here and a good work there. And they never develop a critical mass of redevelopment that, that creates excitement and, a belief and, and helps to improve the public mood, if you will. Uh, it, so it kind of end up, ends up being a wasted opportunity. Also, when all these things are scattered, it's easier to just let them go down the drain because nobody's gonna keep track of a million different little projects. I've seen this happen across the course of my life in Utica, but also in ob observing in other places. So, um, should they should they link those two things? I I think you're right. I think that um, if if Harbor Point gets done, and if it get, it turns out to be the draw that it could be, um, we want to uh, have offer people maximal things to do. Now, my my whole thinking about this, our project is that something like eight million cars pass through this region every single year on the New York State Thruway. And believe it or not, there are a lot of Olmsted groupies out there. And they have to stop somewhere to have lunch or to stay overnight. And if this park is, is recreated, and we are starting to get attention from the National Association of Olmsted Parks, 
then maybe they, this might be one reason for some you know, segment of that group to stop. And so the more of these things that we redevelop, so long as we can do so sustainably, you know, uh, the more likely we are to get that trade. And, and the, the, the anecdotal reportage is that we are getting more people stopping over in Utica. And it's becoming a favored uh, regular stop for people in transit east-west. So, um, and about the environmental park, one thing I didn't mention is that we have an ongoing project to control invasives in the park. And we have uh, very much in our crosshairs of uh, Japanese knotweed, Phragmites, mm -hmm. and, uh, and some other villains. It's a big challenge. So, so also a, a comment and a question. So I grew up in Utica and as a youngster couldn't wait to get the hell out. And <laughs> came back to the area and I'm, I'm in love with the Utica area. Um, when I was growing up, it was said to not go in Proctor Park because it was a dangerous place to go. And, um, but I will say, I'm wondering, so two questions. One is, um, how, are, how are you getting out the good news about this park? Because for the local people, I mean, a lot of times it's the classic thing. You live somewhere and you don't even, it's other people who know more about the good stuff in your area than you do. So that's my first question is that. And second is how can, how can we get involved as volunteers? So thank you. Uh, so um, yeah, you know, <laughs> Utica has a lot of treasure hiding in plain sight. There's also some marvelous public art and uh, actually <laughs> significant public art and some architecture that has an impressive uh, pedigree. Um, and, uh, and Utica has a, has a well-established habit that grew out of the unfortunate events of the late 1950s and 60s and then was intensified by the rust beltization of the town of uh, going well beyond self-deprecation and, uh, and it, it, it at one point turned into just like self-loathing as, as a popular sport uh, in Utica. Things have started to turn on. That's one of the reasons why I came back. I mean, there's still a lot of, uh, uh, you know, sort of uh, naysayers out there, uh, but you're never going to get rid of people like that. Uh, but the there are many more people in this area that want to hear positive stories. And so, yes, we are, um, we are trying to spread that story through talks like this. We've done a, a, a six-part uh, series of short YouTube videos. It's only 31 minute uh, playing time uh, that's been well received. Uh, we, we are also putting out uh, uh, press releases that are being picked up. Uh, I sometimes go on radio talk shows. Um, and so, um, uh, so we are trying to get the word out. Uh, I will say very quickly about the, the whole it's dangerous thing. Well, but all of you is dangerous. It's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a war zone, right? Um, <laughs> you know, nobody has compunction about going to New Orleans or to Las Vegas, or to Orlando, all of which you're more likely to get murdered in than in Utica. Uh, and, you know, but, it's, but we have to listen to this constant drum beat of negativity about Utica, which really annoys me to no extent, uh, if, I, if I'm doing a hard time job of hiding it. Um, and so uh, the reality is I've spoken to the chief of police several times, and, you know, he's pretty candid about the challenges they're up against in certain parts of Utica. And the sad part about Utica is it's the people who live in certain parts of Utica who suffer from the things that we hear. I live in Utica. I, 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 I never experience anything that, uh, that's untoward. Uh, but I'm fortunate enough to live in you know, a neighborhood in which that sort of thing doesn't happen. Um, so, uh, and he said to me that there really aren't any crimes in, in, the, in the two Proctor Parks. The worst thing that happens as occasionally we get vandalism, but you know there isn't a public park on the entire planet that doesn't have vandalism occasionally. So that's that's and if anything, if there's far less of it than there used to be. And um, and also um, in the other Proctor Park, uh, there is a solicitation for uh, illicit rendezvous. Uh, <laughs> and and, and um, that's usually after hours. Uh, Honestly, I, I have, haven't had anybody bring me a credible report of anything uh, apart from somebody saying somebody looked at me strangely. <laughs> and as a former college dean, I've heard that a million times. So. 
Oh, and how, do you, how, really, how do you get involved? Oh, yeah. We have a website. We have a Facebook page. Um, you, you, uh, the, the, um, what's wrong with it? I didn't put our email address on there. Well, anyway, you can go out to our website or our Facebook page. You can message us through Facebook. You can email us and just say, you want to be a volunteer, we'll put you on the list and we'll be in touch. And right now, we are involved in ramping that up. So, and if you volunteer, you're not putting your feet in cement. It's, you, can, you can come as often or as few times as possible, although at some point, if you don't show up at all, we'll drop you on the list. Uh, but um, but um, usually, most people come from one to three times for about two hours. Um, that, then over here. Yeah, thank you. Um, first of all, thank you for the wonderful work you're doing. Thank you. And your, your group. Um, I spent 25 years in Chicago, and as you know, Frederick Law Olmsted Sr., as you talked about at the beginning, uh, his, you know, footprint, handprint is all over that city. Grand Park, Jackson Park, yep. University of Chicago, the surrounding area. And I would say that Chicago really embraces that. Yeah. You know? Um, I sort of became mini obsessed with Olmsted through my time in Chicago yep. and read a lot about him. Um, a lot of what you touched on today is sort of communing with nature and the benefits of communing with nature and access to it. Certainly was, you know, pivotal in, in his work and what drove him and then subsequently his son. Um, I love the fact that you you embrace that, and that's really what you're living out in in this restoration. I'm just curious if you can talk epithelially, if that's a word. Um, do you feel any sort of communing with Olmsted Jr. and continuing his mission? Yeah, I mean, it's, and, and with Proctor, I mean, it's like you know, you do feel like um, there's something a little <laughs> sort of in a certain sense, archaeological about what we're doing here. We're unearthing uh, what these people did in the past and, you know, um, and, you know, justifying the investment the Proctors made in building all of this, I think. Um, and, um, and perfect, to be perfectly honest, I, I, I'm trained as an American historian, but I didn't know much about the, the, the Olmsteads. And until about 10 years ago, I didn't even know that the Olmsteads um, designed this park. And then when I first heard it, I thought, which one? Um, and, um, and it took me a little while to get that into my head. But, um, to, to, you know, I think this partially answers your question. It, the, the, that this kind of communicates deeply to me because uh, kind of like Proctor, I grew up in proximity to these parks. And I benefited from these parks. And I, I, and I knew there was something special about the, them even when I didn't know anything. I never heard of the Olmstead. When I was 18 years old, I went to Union College, and my freshman advisor, when I first met him, looked at this info sheet about me and said, hmm, so you're from Utica. Huh? And I said, yeah. And then he, seems, he said something that seemed to suggest that Utica wasn't quite up to Schenectady's high standards. <laughs> <laughs> and the first thing out of my mouth was to describe the, the parkway and the parks to him and how, how immense it was and how beautiful it was and how special it was to grow up with that. And I said, you don't have anything like that in Schenectady. And he said, I never knew that. He probably learned about Utica from Uticans. We're bad of Utica. Um, so yeah, I, I, I do feel some connection, especially since I've read a, a ton of their correspondence and have poured over the the the, um, the designs, even for designs for things other than this park or the parks in general, because they also did a lot of private landscaping in Utica, um, and um, and it, it feels special. And and, and it's um, and I'm basically retired, so this is kind of and like like and like Proctor, not that I'm Grand Proctor, I certainly don't have his money. Um, I, I kind of can't stay, stay still, and I, I need to be working on it, and I like to build and improve things. So, um, so I kind of feel that connection with them as well. Yeah. I had a question about uh, road signs to direct people from actually the throughway uh, to the Proctor Park. Um, I mean, there's signs, we all know where the signs are for the Utica Zoo and the yeah. Children's Museum, but you need signs to bring people. Um, I, 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 
I drive the parkway over to the Sonic Home down Culver Ave. And of course, I've known T.R. Proctor Park for my whole, I grew up on Proctor Boulevard. Okay. So I know, um, so, but I think that would help people um, like you find. Yeah. I you agree know, with you. Which entrance to go to, to get into the park, for example, would you, do you know how to get there? I do. Okay. Yeah. But I've got a lot of people here don't know. No, and in fact, actually, there are people in Unicode don't know. Um, so, um, and um, so, yeah, we need signage. We need more uh, public education in Utica. I mean, I can see the needle moving uh, among people in Utica. Um, we need to, to continue building up our presence on the internet. Um, and, um, and we are actually doing some work with signage, although not yet of that sort. Uh, but we, we are going to test run, I think, um, a project to actually mark the Olmstead neighborhoods and say you're entering mm -hmm. Ridgewood or, or Parker Boulevard. Um, and, um, and then also I, I wrote the, the successful grant application to get those, those New York State historical markers that are now on the parkway and marking the three parks. So that whole thing, you're right. I mean, especially again, since people in Utica, I mean, people who've lived here all their lives don't know that it's there. Uh, they drive right past these things every day. Obviously, we do need to point them out, and um, and that's definitely on our to-do list over the coming year. Especially once we get this park in better shape, I really do think that there will be outsiders who will drop in just to take a look at it. One more quick question. Um, so have you talked, um, have you come to MVCC to talk? I know you work with Scott Jackson, um, but cause, because I'm a professor at MV, and I'm just thinking, because I agree, keeping the young people here. And so I'm always fighting the, the good fight for you to come amongst my students, yeah. talking about how much great the area is and so on, but I think for them to see the vitality of this kind of space is, you know, all the probably, the local colleges, but MVCC, those are people who are more likely to stay here because many have grown up here. So yeah, you know, and, and this taps into another thing is like local pride. I mean, it, it really is so important. It's for the want of it that Utica has been its own worst enemy. Yeah. Um, because you know, um, as I've sometimes put it, you know, uh, uh, this this self de denigration. Uh, um, is sort of like the you know the kid who wants to go to the prom and keeps telling everybody I'm so ugly you know you know, who, who wants to invite you right um, so and we need friends I mean Utica is an undercapitalized business uh, and we need outside capital to to come in including human capital and we can't afford to lose any more capital so no I haven't spoken at MVCC yet I, there was at one point talk about giving a talk there but it. It just didn't plan out, pan out, partly because it was during a summer when we were just so incredibly busy that I just didn't have time to do follow-up, and the people at the appropriate office didn't follow up with me because they probably had their own things going on. So, um, but you know, I, I'm happy to give talks, uh, and over the course of a year, I do about a half dozen. Um, so, and I'll talk to about just anybody who will listen or pretend to listen. <laughs> <laughs> That's how my whole life is. Any other questions? Please. Well, I'll Thank one more. Um, there is a, I don't know who's currently at Olmstead, but there's a, par a park way long place away where there's a pond and all these flags. It, it's a very small. Is that part of Olmstead City or is that something else? Uh, Sometimes there's wild birds that are there. In, in Utica? Somewhere there. You, maybe you don't know it. It uh, looks like there's no way to get to it. I'm not so sure. <laughs> I, I, well, well, so there, you're not thinking of the reservoirs oh, uh, on Valley View Road near the golf course? No, this is before that. It's, like the oh, it's too hard to describe. I thought you it sounds like the thing that's across from the Utica National Insurance Company in New Hartford. Mm -hmm. that's that's so there are flags there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. that's somewhat new. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, uh, that's 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 somewhat new, and I don't know anything about that. Okay. The, the the town must have built that. Yeah. Um, 
we both grew up in Utica and grew up walking from different parts of Utica to, um, what's the name of it? As, 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 as And so I was, it was such a big part of all the kids' lives. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering if there's work going on there too. Um, not to my knowledge, uh, and it's kind of odd. It should be part of the Olmstead system, but it's not considered so. It's when they did the um, National Register of Historic Places uh, application, they didn't include it, and that's because so. We speak, and I'll try to make this quick. Uh, we speak of Vault Parkway as if it's one unitary thing. It's not. Pleasant Street was there, and Pleasant Street is part of the Parkway. The Parkway is actually a collection of things. There's what we used to call the Upper Parkway that was built uh, from Genesee Street to Mohawk Street between 1908 and 1911, which was then renamed as the Memorial Parkway. Some people think the whole thing is called the Memorial Parkway. It's No, it's that upper bit that goes up to Mohawk Street is. Then Parkway East, which curves around past, past MDCC. And in the old days, Culver Avenue was considered part of the parkway, which isn't so strange because in Buffalo, I said, you know, they have a, a parks, a Olmsted Parks and Parkway system. Well, a lot of those parkways are just two lane streets with trees on, on them, um, but they're the way to the park. Um, and the same thing went with Addison Miller and Horatia Seymour Park. From Genesee Street, Burstone Road was, there are actually references in the 1920s to it being Parkway West. Uh, but then the state DOT came in in 1974, and as you, th those of you who have been here for a long time will know, both Pleasant Street and the Upper Parkway used to be two-way. And the DOT is part of a federal program to speed up uh, inter and intra-urban traffic, uh, decided to make it like a crosstown expressway. They said it wasn't going to be a racetrack, but that's what they, they turned it into. So. <laughs> The, the, the north part goes west and the, and the south part goes east. And as part of that project, they chewed up a large part of Burstone Road and what little charm was left of it was destroyed. Um, and so, um, so I think it was for that, and that plus the fact that those two parks were not designed by Olmsted, that I think the people went for the application and said, that's it. So um, the Mernane, the, the, the Seymour Park is where Murnane Field is, and it sounds, to, my vague impression is that they're, that's something that people keep chewing on, but they can't quite figure out what they want to do with it. Addison Miller did not get any of the, the ARPA money, the, the COVID relief money, as far as I know. So I don't know what the status of that is, which is too bad because it is a nice spot, and it could be a lot nicer. Yeah. Um, and. Um, and, there, and that could be said of like, there are playgrounds across the city that some of which are in pretty good shape and others are you know, less so. And, and, there, and there's also kind of a, a park desert. Uh, it's part of, there's a spot in West Utica and there's a spot in lower Middle East Utica where uh, the Land for Public Trust has, has done some great mapping and they can show, and they have this gold standard of a 10 minute walk to a park. That, and so, um, and in Utica, 77% of the people are within a 10 minute walk of a public park, which you know, it compares favorably to a lot of places. Um, although what's particularly interesting is that 85% of low income Uticans are within a 10 minute walk. Uh, so, um, so there's all the more reason to be working on all this. But, um, but like I said, we're staying focused on this park until we feel that that mission is not only accomplished, but we're confident we have a sustainability plan. Uh, we're not going to go too far afield, although we might be doing a project elsewhere in the system this year if we can get a, a patron in New York City and um, the city of Utica to get on the same page. Uh, but if that happens, you'll be better. Oh. <laughs>